Hi everyone. Today I want to show you a game from the Candidates Tournament in 1962 between Robert James Fisher, affectionately known as Bobby to many of us in the chess world. And he had the white pieces. And with the black pieces was another giant of the chess world, probably the greatest player. And of course, this is up for debate. But the greatest player never to become world champion, Victor the Terrible Korchnoi. With the black pieces. Now, this game started out. Fisher playing his beloved E4, D6. There's the start of the picks defense. So we know we're going to get an imbalanced game here. D4. We know that Fisher was very classically motivated in his choice of openings for the most part. Although he did dabble with some of the hyper-modern openings. This was basically his bread, bread and butter. <coughs> Excuse me. So after E4, D6, D4. Knight f6 with the old classical idea of, or Nemzovician idea if we're going to use that word, of first restricting the center. That's what d6 does, right? d6 prevents the further movement of this pawn to e5. Why is that important? Well, the Alicon's defense, right? Just the Immediate knight f6 and counterattack and threat against the e-pawn. <clears throat> White's only move for an advantage and correct move is to demobilize the opponent by playing e5. And then play will go knight d5, etc. So what d6, <clears throat> d6 seeks to improve on that scenario by restricting the further advance of the e pawn and by fixing the pawn on e4 then it can qualify as a target because we don't attack moving targets but fixed targets we can attack so now we see the pawn is being fixed and now black seeks to attack it so now d4 so again Classically motivated, taking over these uh, squares in the center that are very important. Now black plays knight f6. Now you might say, well, and these are kind of, I'm going over in detail these beginning moves because I know there's a lot of novice chess players watching. And a lot of us that have been playing chess for a long time take these moves for granted. So now you might ask yourself, well, can't e5 be played right now? To demobilize the knight. Because the pawn is attacked by the way. So now let's look at it. Because in a perfect world of course. White would love to be able to attack the knight. But here it's bad. Because after e5. D takes e5. Right. D takes e5. And it's not the only move of course. Queen d1. King d1, and now white has forfeited his castling privileges, and the old trap, knight g4, is played. You see, now the f2 pawn is attacked, threatening to fork king and rook, and the e5 pawn is attacked. So now, just like that, white's once proud two-pawn center is totally destroyed. A fork is threatened on f2. And white has lost his right to castle. This is why e5 is not possible here. So the battle continues. Fisher played knight c3. Okay, so now before I go any further, I want to show you a game uh, showing the main ideas of this attack that's about to ensue. So first, Let's show you the next two moves, or the next move rather. So Fisher played knight c3, as I showed you that 
he cannot push so he develops a piece which supports and protects this pawn so of course eventually white wants to re uh, mobilize his center where he can push but right now it's not safe so he puts the knight there develops a piece reinforces the center Korsnoy plays g6 with the idea of fearing this bishop and after all it's a good idea because the bishop as we can see by this move d6 in the beginning we're already blocking the avenue of this bishop getting out so after d6 it makes sense <clears throat> that the most effective square for that bishop dark square bishop will be on g7 because there's more prospects more um, chances for action in the game of course just to make a point here a move like e6 is playable right white is not lost here excuse me black is not lost and say after knight f3 the bishop can go to e7 but his prospects are really dismal and uh, quite defensive in nature Although this is uh, this is playable, so g6 gives black the black bishop more prospects, and it falls in line with his idea of fixing right and counter attacking white center, as the bishop will x-ray through d4, c3, and b2. And A1 putting pressure on the pawn. On the pawn center. Also note that the position of D6. Right being on a dark square. It exerts pressure because pawns capture diagonal, diagonally. So the pawn on D6 exerts pressure on the E5 square and C5 square. This also fits in with the bishop being on G7 as it contributes to the battle on these important dark squares and later on sometimes you see moves like c5 adding more pressure so we can see the logic of <clears throat> black setup so right now I want to show you a game uh, okay first Fisher's next move with was f4 so this is important for me to bring this up this is known as the so-called Austrian attack which is probably the most aggressive attack against the Pyrrhic defense and you see it also against the modern defense what's the modern well instead of playing e4 d6 the modern skips that and plays g6 right away usually now you can reach the modern from d6 and after d4 you wouldn't play knight f6 allowing uh, the knight to become a target you play g6 right away. That constitutes the modern. Now, the main difference between the modern and the pyrrhics is that the modern is a bit more flexible. But understand that since you have more flexibility as black, white also has more flexibility to do different things. So it's a trade-off. So I'm not saying one is better than the other, but it's, it's a trade-off. At least with knight f6, you're putting some kind of immediate pressure on the center. Whereas with g6, again, you're kind of waiting for more information uh, from white to uh, proceed. So g6 and f4. So let's stop right here. And I want to show you a game of what basically what happens when white gets his way in the position. Okay, now we've stepped into the time machine and we're now at Nuremberg, 1896. And this game is between Sigrid Tarish, one of the um, pioneers of the classical, uh, quote-unquote classical, two-pawn in the center. Knights on F3 and C3, bishops on C4 and F4, school of chess. And this game is against another legend, Rudolf Shiruzek. Tarish had the white pieces and Shiruzek the black pieces. Now I'm going to flip the board. We're going to look at it from White's perspective. And I just want to show you what the Austrian attack is about. 
So again, here we go. 1896. So Fisher wasn't playing anything new. His game with course noise about 70 years later. We see the same setup. So after Bishop G7 was played, with the same ideas, and we already discussed about um we already discussed our uh, attack <clears throat> in the center. We already discussed uh, White's ideas <clears throat> of wanting to push the E pawn eventually, but it not being uh, tactically feasible at the moment. <clears throat> so with this move F4, another pawn is placed to enforce this move uh, F4. So many different moves have been tried and this is 1896, so we're early in the theory of this opening. So many moves have, have been tried. But Taris plays uh, in the modern way. He plays knight f3. Again, e5. <clears throat> e5 has been tried. And again, it's up to uh, Black to try to prove his point. D takes e5 can be played. Uh, there's a couple of couple of continuations here that's possible and uh, comfortable for black. So, for instance, knight f d seven, knight f three, see castle, bishop c four, and uh, perhaps knight b six and bishop b three, and black. Has managed to develop <clears throat> in a way around around the uh, this three point center. So knight c6, for example. Castle. Bishop g4, and notice that even though white center is advanced, it's not really affecting black's position. So black is done what we call playing around around the center. And then what happens eventually is this these three pawns become a liability as they constantly have to be protected. And we see some holes in the light squares. So play can continue, say bishop e3. And now instant equality. D5. Right? So now black has a share in the center. Say h3. Bishop takes. Queen takes. E6. And say after knight a4, knight takes. And if you know your pawn structures, you could kind of see where the game is going. And we got kind of like a front structure. So after say c3, <clears throat> knight could jump into f5. Even c6 can be played. And then black will pre prepare c5 with say for instance rook c8. Etc. Etc. And black has equalized and neutralized the center. <clears throat> White has the bishop here, but one of these bishops is very bad, and um, the game would be equal here. But it took a long time and a lot of practice to show that White just can't blow black off the board. But these type of attempts were done in the early days. But back to the game. So here's Tarish and uh, Shiruzek. So after f4, bishop g7. And Tarish doesn't try e5 right away. I told you that that's premature. So he keeps developing behind the pawn center. Knight f3. Castle. Bishop e2. Uh, bishop d3 is possible also. But... Bishop e2 was played. And now black plays an inter interesting move here and tries to exploit white's um, lack of reinforcement of e4 here. And he plays an early d5 here. And that move is it's, it's playable. It's not a like a loser move. It's playable. But I don't see a real satisfactory continuation for black here. So what happened in this game was knight e8. Now the knight is like really out of play. Um, 
So this is already a problem how to get this knight back into the picture. So we have to look at other alternatives for the knight. If he jumps into e4, which is what he would like to do, so knight takes e4, d takes e4, knight g5 attacking the pawn. Only way to protect the pawn really is queen d5 or bishop f4. Bishop f4 could be met by g4. And say for instance knight c6 trying to counterattack the d pawn, that could be met by c3. And then the pawn still attacked. So queen d5, c4 hitting the queen, check. And then say after king f2 check, that pawn is a pawn is going to fall. Now f6. And basically here the idea is that black is basically trying to gain some activity off the pawn sacrifice. So e takes f6, e takes f6, and knight takes e4, f5, knight g5, knight c6, attacking the pawn, d5, knight d4, bishop e3, uh, c5 is interesting by black, but knight takes e2, and queen takes e2. And we can see that it seems that black does not have enough for the pawn. He's still a pawn down here. So he could play bishop d7 followed by uh, rook a e8. But it seems like he just doesn't have enough in that white will be able to um, consolidate. So that's why knight e4 is that's probably, it's better than knight e8 I think. Because at least the knight is just not out the game. Like it creates some type of activity. The other move I was looking at was knight g4. And uh, <clears throat> so after knight g4, h3 is natural, knight h6, bishop e3, and then say after knight tries to hop back. Attack the uh, bishop on e3. Bishop drops back. And the idea is g4. c6. Then after g4. White is just better. He's expanding on the king side. He has a nice grip in the center. And his king side attack is well under underway. So all white has to do now is play queen d2. Castle queen side. And black's... Um, and black's uh, queen side counterplay hasn't even started yet. So I think uh, white would be close to winning soon uh, if this position arrived on the board. So say all of that to say that this move d5 uh, is, que is questionable. And if you are going to play d5, then, you know, it's, look at it almost as a gambit. And then play e4 and see if you can get some activity. You know, it might be a good surprise weapon. But that has to be the best out of the possibilities. So anyway, so d5. So e5 was played. Knight e8. Bishop e3. e6. Again, this is Tarish with the white pieces. Shuruzek with the black pieces. And... We see uh, black trying to go for this like advanced French structure, but again, it's too slow because right away h4, and you see how fast the um, white's king side attack kicks off. So there's no counterplay on the queen side that's gonna match the speed of white's attack over here on the king side. C5 can't even be played yet without Gambit in the pawn because of the bishop being here. So knight C6 is played by Sharuzek. And uh, now he really needs the C pawn to come out. But his idea is to play the knight here, right? Because remember, this knight is, is kind of paralyzed here. So what he's going to try to do is bring this knight here, here, and here. And that's it. That takes too long. It's three moves. So, knight c6, 
85, 97, and then to add insult to injury. All right, so G4 is played. So to add insult to injury, not only does Black's plan take super long with this knight C6, 97, and then tonight at 5, he doesn't even get to get on F5. So he does all of, all of that to to have a monkey wrench thrown in. After G4, Black gets desperate. Plays move F5. Now this is a sign of a bad position because any play from Black on the king side, like pawn moves, that all that does is help White open up the position. Right? The desperation. To stop the, uh, you know, to try to stop the attack. And of course, nobody's going to play G takes F5 and allow the knight to sit there. Even though he could still play it. That's how good, that's how good White's position is. Is he could make this mistake and still win the position. But of course, the obvious move is just to open up the position on the G file. And that's what he does. He plays H takes G6. Knight takes G6. So, he feels like he has a home for the night. I mean, it's not where he wants to be, but, you know, nevertheless, uh, he goes there. And now, at this point, he could play G takes. Instead, he plays Bishop D3. So, like they say, it's not the, uh, or it's the execution. You know, sometimes the execution is better to, than the threat. That's the, uh, the phrase I was looking for. And now we have this idea of G takes F5. And then, of course, the rook can take. H6. And uh, black is just in a world of trouble here. Now, Taris plays G5, which is playable. Again, the idea is just to open up the position of h5, then the rook takes. Right, of course, he doesn't want to take. Um, but instead of g5, just g takes, e takes, followed by queen e2, and castling queen side and bringing the rooks over is uh, almost decisive for black. You know, just getting that last piece, that rook on a1 into the game. It's just a logical conclusion of the matter. So, for instance, c6, queen g2, gaining a full tempo right here. King f7, trying to get the king out of there. And then just castle followed by rook g1, rook dg1. And um, so that just spells all kind of trouble. But instead of g takes f5, that's what happens sometimes when you have multiple winning continuations. So... He, you, sometimes you go with the one you see first. So he might have saw g5 first. King h7 is played. And now he played queen e2. With the same idea of transferring the queen over. Rook h8. Again, uh, simple g takes h6 could be played. But he played queen g2 first. c5 finally... There's some queenside counterplay, but it is way, 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 way too late. And that's way with uh, echo. Like if you were in the Grand Canyon, like way, 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 way too late. And then G takes H6. And um, so Ruzek resigned. So I just wanted to show you that game be to show you what it looks like when White has his way in this, this, um, this Austrian attack. You know, he basically pushes, blows uh, 98. Again, like I told you, it was bad. Basically, D5 and 98 were the culprits. Because if you're going to play D5, then you probably got to throw a 94. So we discussed that. So I just wanted to show you what it looks like when White just basically gets to do what he wants to do. And that's another note that you got to uh, keep in mind is that when you're playing those kind of defenses where you allow, like, White to obtain a, a early pawn center. You better know what you're doing because you really don't have that much room for error as you would have if you had like a classical uh, pawn center. Because you're in those cramped positions and you make a mistake, 
your whole game could just be destroyed very early. And I mean, after E5 98, White's Black's game is already in severe trouble because of that knight on E8. That one piece is just killing White's game. Excuse me, killing Black's game. And then just to think that all he could come up with here in this position is this long-winded plan, knight C6, knight E7, and here that doesn't even work. Just shows you that you have to respect the big center and make sure that you have your... uh you know, your P's and Q's in order. So now, let's get back in our time machine. Okay, so we've traveled in our time machine 66 years, and we're back at the Candidates Tournament in uh, 1962 in Curacao. Again, Robert Fisher, affectionately known as Bobby, has the white pieces against Victor Korsnoy with the black pieces. Now we're going to flip the board and look at it from Korsnoy's perspective now if you remember the game i just showed you here in this position right after bishop e2 and in fact i just skimmed through the moves real quick d6 d4 and we discussed the meaning of all of these moves and ideas bishop g7 knight f3 castle bishop e2 so we had the same moves played by taris and shiruzek 66 years ago and or 66 years before this game. And here, Shiruzek with the black pieces had played this move D5. And we had came to the conclusion that it is quite, um, it's not adequate for black to achieve equality, although it is, it is it's sort of inter interesting. So, Victor Korsnoy had an improvement here. And he played the move C5. Now, what's the idea behind C5? Let's see. So, Fisher played D takes C5. And then, Korsnoy played the dynamic continuation. Queen A5. What's the idea here? Notice that the knight is pinned. Right? Because it's... White is not castled, so therefore this pawn is under scrutiny. Remember, the main idea in these openings is black. It's attacking and destroying the white center. But before you can attack and destroy, you have to fix it. You have to keep it immobile. Now, even though theoretically or legally the pawn can move, for instance, e5 can be played, d5 can be played, the moves would serve some kind of detriment to black so for example excuse me a detriment to white so for example we had discussed uh so after c5 if d5 is played right going into like a benoni type structure well again you you start to attack in the center immediately right so for instance so after castle E takes, E takes, and you can play rook E8, for example. And black has a good position because white center has pretty much been dismantled. He has this D pawn, but it's not really a big problem here. So play could continue, uh, let's say just H3. Here we go, knight a6, rook e1, and playing it in Benoni fashion, bishop d7, trying to come up with some constructive moves here, a3, and it's possible to play a move like queen a5 here, because of the position of this rook, b4 is not playable. And say after knight d2, the idea may be coming here or here, scaring the queen off. B5 with this queen side expansion. And notice how uh, this queen side expansion for black, 
unites with the concept of the bishop being on this dark square diagonal. This is called peace coordination. Everything goes together. And then you notice this pawn on d4, excuse me, d5 is not really doing anything to hinder uh, or demobilize blacks position then you would see the thing is is a lot of uh, people don't understand is that just having pawns in the center in itself doesn't really account for nothing the, the pawns have to be doing something either the, the pawns have you're using the pawns to open lines for yourself like for your rooks to take over a file or something or uh, use the pawn as an anchor point for a piece right like as a um, you know, outpost for a knight or a rook or something like that. Or you're demobilizing your opponent. In other words, making it hard for him to develop his pieces. You're using the pawn is being used for a wedge or something like that. In other words, if you just have a pawn just out there like that and it's not doing anything, then it's just a liability because it's an enemy territory. It still has to be protected by your pieces. So in this case right here, yeah, there's a pawn on d5, but... It's not like black is trying to use this square. So black just simply plays around it. It's not like he has a knight here or here. Or he's able to do anything. Or he even has control of the e-file. So black has everything he wants. He's counterattacking on the queen side. And then the dark square is a weak. So he controls that. And then eventually this pawn being in enemy territory. He has to worry about moves like b4. Driving the protector away. So this pawn is a liability. And believe it that in this position. Black is better. Definitely better here. Okay. So like for instance if that. Move like c4. With the idea of knight jumping in. Jumping in. The killer move. Alright. So that was like a little tangent. I'm just trying to get you to understand. So, so D5 is possible, right? But not necessarily the best. So just because the center can move, right? It, it's not just about moving the center, but it has to be able to, to move and achieve the effects that I mentioned as far as like demobilizing the pieces or uh, creating some kind of wedge in the position. Something that really hinders and hampers Black from doing what he wants to do. Advancing without achieving those results just create weakness. So, so c5 is played. So, of course, Fisher didn't play d5. Um, again, just a, another quick example. What about e5 here? Now, after knight, knight fd7, again, now we see all kind of pressure. On white's pawn structure. I mean, that pawn structure cannot stand like that. It's too much pressure on it. And the best for white is probably to fall into that Bononi setup. But again, we had the same analogous position to what I mentioned. <clears throat> where, <clears throat> where black will easily expand on the queen side. And this will become very strong. And then, if he takes here, knight t5 is playable, but again, we're trying to destroy the center. So we take this way. You see? And what does is, what is, uh, white have left of the center? So it's very, very critical position. So c5 is played by Korsnoy. D takes C5. And again, we're trying to destroy the center. So remember that idea. So this is playable. Right? Don't, you know, don't think you can't play that. But that's not the best move. You know, White would welcome that. Because he just has this pawn right here. And so you have the castle. Right? Let's say queen B6. Right? Maybe E5. Notice. Can't jump there, can't jump there. So now the advance has some has some um purpose to it. See how it demobilizes the 
So the only move is to insert this rook in there. And maybe at the queen e1. And knight g4. But notice again, the advance had purpose there. And notice how these pawns block this bishop. One of the ways of dealing with the bishop. Other move that looks natural too is just knight d5. But after knight takes d5, rook takes d5, this bishop comes out with the tempo here. And now this comes under uh, scrutiny. So then after a move like e6, this bishop is, is shut out of action. This knight is made stronger because now in the future he might be able to go here and come here. And uh, black's counterplay is becoming uh, difficult. Matter of fact, that would probably be my next move because not only is the f6 square a concern for black, but also the d6 square. So this is why black does his captures, makes this routine capture d6. If you keep in mind that you're trying to destroy the opponent's center, you wouldn't think about a move a move like that. Instead, you play queen a5, maintaining the pressure on the center. See, now you're threatening to take here, and that's what you want. Because the idea and philosophy is that your opponent, right, in this case Fisher, has taken the time to build up an enormous center, three pawns. That's three temp. That's it took. In other words, it took three uh, tempo or tempi to build that center. So if that center just gets destroyed, that means he wasted three tempi, basically for nothing. And with those three tempi, if Black is developing and playing like it's supposed to, Black is going to be better at the end of at the end of all of that. So that's why it behooves White to maintain the center as, as much as he can and this is where the battle is and this is why these games are so interesting because of the unbalanced uh nature unbalanced nature of the position so queen a5 once again fisher castle now you might be saying hey what about c takes why, why not uh <clears throat> c takes well again knight takes e4 d takes e7 rook e8 no problem we'll give up the pawn queen d3 then here, you can play uh, rook takes e7, or you can even play bishop takes c3, destroying the pawn structure, b takes c3, and then rook takes e7. Again, look at white's pawn structure. Black is better here. If you don't want to give up that bishop, you can just play rook takes e7. And you still got a still got a good game. Again, notice the final results and look at white center. So it's all about the center. So Fisher Castle, he knows he knows what time it is. Queen takes c5 with check. King h1. And now knight c6. So we see good development from black here. Nice natural development. And notice the influence on the dark squares. The queen, bishop is right here. And again, white would love to be able to mobilize his pawns, but he has to has to wait till the right time. Okay, what do I mean? Well, if e5, d takes e5, f takes e5, knight takes e5, and then let's attack the queen, right? Maybe distract him from that knight, right? He's only... Knight is only protected by the queen, right? Queen a5 would happen. And then knight takes, queen takes, and bishop f4. And how is white to justify being down a pawn? So, again, can't do it. So Fisher plays knight d2. The idea of knight d2 is to... Uh, actually, I can't say idea. It's more than one idea. One is, of course, to harass the queen over here and basically try to exploit the queen's early, uh, you know, early uh, foray into the middle of the board. The other is to initiate a queen, a king side attack. So by doing this, it clears the way 
for the bishop and queen battery here. And now he can play moves like that. G4. And not have to worry about the capture. Right there, he can, right here, he can't play G4 because the pawn would just get snatched up. So he plays that with the double idea of playing that. And this. A5. So Korsnoy anticipates that. But Fisher, so Fisher, but Fisher's going to play A4 first. Now Fisher could have played Knight B3 right away. And then maybe Queen B6 with the idea of A4 uh, coming next. The outcome would have probably still been the same. Instead, he plays a4 first. So he stops black from gaining more space on the queen side. Knight b4. It's a common move that you see once the um, once a player has given up a square. Like, for instance, sometimes you'll see that where black plays h5 or white plays h4. And gives up the g5 or g4 accordingly. You see the same thing. Black's. B5 square is vulnerable also. So, knight B4 is played, but it also has the idea of putting pressure here so that this knight can't move because of the pressure on the C2 pawn. So, knight B3. Queen B6. Again, there's more tactical ideas here. One of them, it makes it hard for black to develop his bishop. Right? Because the queen is on the dark squares. Another idea is once this queen, say, say if the queen wanted to move here, the knight is still harassing this square. So right now the queen has to do this dirty job of just protecting the pawn. And also in some lines... Their bishop on, uh, excuse me, the knight on b3 becomes vulnerable. So after queen b6, Fisher feels it's safe to continue with this plan. He plays g4. Right? And after all, the pawn is protected by the bishop and queen and attacked by the knight and bishop. So, it seems like the numbers cancel out each other. I just want to show you that a natural looking move, rook f3, is bad and gives black a big advantage on the simple account of knight g4 with the idea of just winning the exchange after knight f2. It's really um, no defense because if the queen tries to come, say, to f1, then the knight uh, attacks c2 successfully. So, rook f3 is, is a blunder there. So, Fisher played g4. And then Korsnoy found a um, fantastic move here. He played bishop takes g4. This is all based on what we've been talking about for the last minute or so. Weakness of the c2 square. So, check it out. So, after bishop takes g4, bishop takes g4, knight takes g4. And guess what? The queen is pulled away. Queen takes g4. Knight c2. So now, here's that knight I was telling you about. Right now, the knight is unprotected and this uh, rook is under a, a attack. Of course, no, I mean, uh, Fisher plays knight b5. The idea is to block the action of the queen right there. Okay, so now he loses the exchange. And knight takes a1. So now we see that Korsnoy has the two rooks. Um, and Fisher has come up with the exchange. However, uh, Korsnoy has a pawn um, and the exchange. And the difference here is usually the two pieces are better. But here, if you notice that white's pieces are real awkward looking and not coordinated. And that's something you really don't see too much in Fisher games. But you see the knight on uh, here. Bishop still undeveloped. 
the rook is still on the f file queen is on the g file and the king is in the corner the the, the position does not have the harmony that it should have Meanwhile, black's pieces look real easy to play. Like, for instance, bishop is here, very powerful. Keep, oops, keeping uh, this bishop home, guarding this. I mean, it's obvious to bring the pieces to the C file. And meanwhile, you have all of this space around the uh, white king. I mean, who's, <laughs> white is conducting the king side attack or trying to, but whose king is really in danger here? I mean, Black's King looks perfectly safe. So let's see how the game continued. What would you play here, anyway? Queen C6, real natural move. The pawn is hanging, right? And behind that pawn is the king. So nothing magical, nothing spectacular, just common sense. Fisher rages on with the uh, king side attack. And Korsnoy... Finds a great move. He plays queen c4. And of course the idea is hindering any kind of movement of this pawn because of the queen on g4. I like doing that with the arrows. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so, queen f3. And notice too, in case you didn't notice, look at the attack pieces here. So not only is this stopped but this guy is unprotected right rook on f1 and you got this pawn here so got to protect a valuable piece here so queen f3 and now queen takes a4 wins the pawn and you have this knight unprotected here and this knight unprotected here so fisher Weighs his options. He plays knight c7. Right? Attacking the rook. Right? He figures, hey, you take my uh, knight on a1, I'll take your rook. So, that's what happens. Queen takes a1. And Fisher plays knight d5 here. Now, you might say, well, why didn't he take the rook? Uh, I think Fisher just felt that he would have better chances uh, trying to uh, keep his pieces on the board here. Um, if knight takes a8, which to me is like a natural looking continuation, rook takes, well, now you have even, uh, material and, uh, excuse me, even pieces, right? But white is just up, excuse me, white is just down several points, down several points here. Um, and of course, no, would just convert. So after f takes g6, f takes g6, not, not h takes g6, because it'll just simply queen takes f7. But f takes check, queen b3 check, and the idea of course is protecting some more material. Queen f7 check, king h8, same thing. Queen takes b7. Attacking the rook. And of course, you would like to try to get that in there. Right, but that's not really possible. Rook f8. Rook takes, bishop takes, queen c8. Protecting and attacking at the same time and it's good if you can do moves like that when you do have to do a defensive move try to do a defensive move that contains a little poison for your opponent king g8 queen c4 check king g7 queen c3 check king f7 queen c4 e6 king g2 and bishop e7 and now we see that black Consolidating and just will go on with this extra material advantage, extra pawns. So instead of knight takes a8, Fisher decides, hey, that rook on a8 isn't doing anything. I'm going to bring my knight on d5 into the center. And then maybe perhaps in some world he could provoke e6, moves like that, and get a chance to get this in there. You know, and basically create more problems 
for black. So knight d5 is played and seems like a good practical decision. But Korsnoy is very strong grandmaster Soviet from the Soviet school. Plays rook a e8. So he stops the, you know, nonsense with just when, you know, playing e7. Check here. And he gets his other rook into play. Fisher plays bishop g b bishop g five, and Korsnoy, being known as a, as one of the greatest pawn grabbers uh, in the history of chess, grabs the <laughs> grabs the pawn. Bishop takes e seven, and now Korsnoy finds great. And you know what's what too is uh, just to go off on a little tangent. Is if you want to study defense and chess, Korsnoy is a good good player to study because I mean this guy grabs pawns in positions that most of us would never grab the pawn then and then he'll just defend and find find players would collapse under. So here it looks like maybe Fisher can pull something out. I mean he's lost here. I mean look at those pawns. I mean if the game goes to the ending pure king and pawn ending of course he's busted. So Here's Fisher trying to pull something out, and Korsnoy finds a cold-blooded Bishop E5 just threatening mate right here on H2. So, of course, Fisher has to stop what he's doing. Stop that. Rook F2. Again, defending and attacking. Right? Defends the mate, attacks the queen. Queen C1 check. Rook F1. Defending and attacking. Queen h6, brutal. Renewing the threat of mate. Finally, finally forces Fisher to make a totally passive move. h3, no more defending and attacking. That was just a purely defensive move, right? Something he didn't want to do. You know what that translates to? Loss of tempo, loss of time. In other words, Korsnoy has a full, like a free move, basically. Do whatever you want to improve your position. With that, Korsnoy makes a fan, uh, a risky. Uh, I mean, it's fantastic from the terms of the the, the audacity that he shows. <laughs> he, he's basically not. He's saying, "I'm not afraid of you." G takes f4, just opening up the position. Who would do that? Now, just so you know, that's not the only move. I mean, Rook takes e7 is good. Uh, King h8, and his Queen d2, that and mate again. He just opens up the position. G takes f5. Bishop takes f8. Rook takes f8. Knight e7. And that looks scary because, you know, the knight's going to come here. Right? King h8. Knight takes f5. Queen to e6. Look at that. Rook g1. And it looks like, you know, Fisher might be able to pull something, pull a rabbit out of the hat here. And now Korsnoy just calmly advances the pawn. Like, okay, man, I'm going to make a queen. I don't know how you're going to make me. <laughs> try, he's like, basically, try to make me. I'm going to get this queen. So rook g4. Queen b3. I mean, just, man moves strong moves so now we can look at that move a4 again and that's what i like about going over these games is you see so much so we see a4 right the idea of course he wants to queen eventually you know so you put you know what do they say pass pawns must be pushed so we see a dual purpose one bring the pawn closer to queening but the second purpose penetrate into the enemy territory and offer this trade to queens. Because remember now, this pawn has to be protected by a piece. So after this, the queen can't really go too far. Maybe the queen goes here or something like that. But this pawn has to be watched. So we see. Now what? And it's interesting too that this move, rook g4... He kind of blocks the queen off. Fisher blocks his queen off from being able to get to h5. So 
maybe <clears throat> maybe rook g5 was you know a little better that way if queen h3 perhaps he could play a move like that even though he probably still be busted <clears throat> Okay, so rook g4 was played though. Queen b3. And now queen f1, of course, Fisher doesn't want to trade. But, again, he gives up a full tempo. He has to keep an eye on that pawn, like I said. a3. Rook g3 from Fisher. And now, Korsnoy. <laughs> man, Korsnoy is brutal, man. Like, <laughs> Why'd he do that? You know, when I saw this move, I was like, man, why do you have to do that to Fisher like that, man? It's like, man, just took the rook. You know what I mean? Like, wow. Queen takes g3. And you might be wondering what happens after knight takes g3. Well, the, just push the pawn. Right? Just push the pawn. After knight takes, after knight takes g3, a2. There's no stop. There's no stopping it because the bishop on e5 is the master of the chessboard right now. Right? a2, and there's no stopping it. h1. So, that is it. Fisher, Fisher resigned after queen g3. And that is, um, that's one of my favorite games. I, I, I say that on a lot of videos. There's probably a thousand chess games. I'll be like, that's one of my favorite games. <laughs> you know, but... It's just when I look at them again, you know, and I see, you know, the richness in, in there, I'm just like, whoa, you know, this is something else. So, and by the way, made is threatened also. <laughs> so, anyway, Fisher resigned. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. Press that like button. Subscribe. As always, tell, tell your friends. And, um, you know, I hope the videos aren't too long, but it's like, you know, I'm trying to explain for you know like the rank amateur and the, and plus give some substance to those that are you know a little bit higher rated like you know 1900 2000 you know 2100 you know that they can appreciate also so trying to do all of that you know takes time because i don't want to leave the beginning player out you know and he's wondering well what's the purpose of d6 at the e4 you know stuff like that you know so i'm trying to you know include everybody so anyway, I'll see you guys on the next video.